Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar this uh, evening. Uh, I'm Lena and I'm Elsa and uh, we are the authors of Retrieving for All Occasions. So uh, this webinar we will, uh, um, uh, well you can ask anything you want. Uh, we prefer if you ask questions about gun, gun dog training or dog training, of course, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we will follow you. Uh, and we have some questions that we had before the seminar that we have prepared, prepared some answers for, but you can, you can ask us in the, in the Q&A uh, and uh, well, just write down your question and we will try to answer it. Yes, so uh, we're just going to start with showing you a bit of the background about uh, Leon and me. Um, we wrote the book Retrieving for All Occasions in 2012 uh, in Swedish and then translated it to English a couple of years later. And both of us uh, work part time as um, gun dog instructors uh, at the moment. Um, well, we do instruct in other things as well, but mainly focusing on gun dog training. Um, so as Leanna just said, today's webinar is about asking anything you want. Uh, and uh, if you're joining us on uh, Facebook, uh, we'll try to answer those questions as well. Uh, but if you want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions, please join us via, uh, via Zoom because um, they will see the questions more easily. Okay. Yeah, let's begin. Or uh, uh, do you want to say anything else before we start? No, I think no. we should get going. Yes, and our first question is from Lisa. And her question, I read her question so you all can hear it. I have just begun to teach my six month old lab the stop signal. He's very good at it uh, when he's close to me, but when he's a few meters from me, he first wants to go to, to me before he sits. How can I do so he sits where he stands a bit from me? Well, uh, do you want to start or I can start? <laughs> yeah, I said, say that's a, a quite common uh, problem to start with when you start teaching the stop whistle because you tend to start teaching it when the dog is close to you. So um, it's very natural for them to come by your feet and sit there. Um, one of our first things that we, we usually do is actually have a, a helper uh, having a flat collar and a lead on the dog uh, so that the helper could just loosely hold the lead when the dog is standing a few feet away from you and then you blow the stop whistle. If the dog walks towards you, um, the helper will just uh, tighten the leash slightly, not pulling or anything, just holding it slightly until uh, the dog sits uh, and then you reward the dog. You repeat that a couple of times until uh, there is no, no tension in the leash any longer and the dog sits as soon as it hears the stop whistle. Uh, then you can increase uh, the distance. Um, so that, that is one way. Um, but Lena, we, we have a few other ones. Yeah, well, one of my favorite way is that I, I, I very often uh, work with platforms, place boards. Uh, so I, I uh, teach my dog to love to go on a, well, a platform in anyway in any kind it can be like a, a small box or something where the dog can uh, sit uh, and when they can when they love to go to the platform and sit on the platform I just uh, uh, reward them there and then I add the stop signal uh, when they go to the platform so they sit and I, I blow the whistle at the same time uh, and then I increase the distance between me and the platform and just send the dog away so, saying yes and the dog goes away to the platform who he loves uh, and then I blow the stop whistle and then I take uh, then it's very good to have a helper the first time I, I send the dog maybe like three times to the platform uh, blow the stop whistle uh, from maybe three meters or something and then uh, I ask my helper to take the platform away so the dog can go to the spot where the platform was before and then I try to blow the whistle again and you can use that in in uh, I mean you can send the dog for 30 meters to the platform if you want to and you can back chain it so you can start with uh, uh, close to the uh, platform and then go further and further away uh, so that is another way to uh, to teach them to it's it's possible to uh, sit uh, away from me 
uh, it's not, as Elsa said, it, it's uh, quite common that the dog wants to come close to us because they get so much reinforcement close to us in all type of training, actually. So um, they have to uh, just understand that it's possible to sit or do things away from us. Uh, and then you could, of course, uh, do things where you're letting, for example, your helper reward your dog when the dog is at the distance away from you, so you don't have to run as much back and forth. Mm. Um, and also a reverse luring uh, can be very helpful if the dog knows that uh, to actually make the dog stay where uh, he or she is. Uh, and then you go to the dog and reward it uh, where, where it is. And you can use reverse luring too when, when, you, when you go to the dog. Sometimes the dog wants to come closer to you when, they, when the dog see you coming closer, closer to him. So open your hand and walk and do uh, um, reverse luring at the same time. Then you help the dog, to, you inform the dog that this is right. Just stay where you are, it's right. Many dogs... Uh, that I see can be a little bit insecure when you train this because they are not so used to being um, uh, trained uh, on a distance from us. So if you, if you want to make them really sure of uh, themselves, uh, do other things, um, tricks and so on, uh, where the dogs uh, do things a little bit uh, with a distance from you. Um, I recommend that. So Lisa, we hope that would answer your question and give you some ideas about what you can train more. Um, so then we've got a few questions that we have uh, prepared. I think we're going to start with one of them. And uh, Lena, this one about recall. We've got the question about how can I improve my dog's recall? Yeah. Well, uh, if the dog have a good recall, then it means freedom for the dog. So I think it's a good everyday life thing for the dog to know. And, um, and of course, if you do gumbo training, it's very important to have a good recall. I mean, you have to be able to recall the dog from a really hard situation with birds and so on involved. So uh, the first thing to uh, think about is that you, you, of course, will do lots of successful recalls, lots of rewards. So the dogs know that uh, it's, it's a very good thing to do, of course. And also, um, uh, you also need to have a really great reward. And, and you can have a great reward, and then you can have a great, great, great reward. <laughs> so if you are practicing this, um, and, and then you are out walking with your dog, and uh, something happens that is really hard, and the dogs dog dog listen to your recall and come to you then you have to give them a, an extra good reward so uh, bring something really good smashing good with you i know elsa you used to have uh, some cat food in a small bag but don't you yeah yeah uh, those are great small bags that you could buy with uh, wet cat food and uh, so you could well, they're, they're completely sealed, so you could have them in your um, pocket uh, for quite some time before using them. And when that great moment happens, the dog responds beautifully to your to a very difficult recall. You could just bring it out and reward them. Mm. So um, uh, another another thing that is very important is, of course, that you you will try to to avoid the dog from rewarding himself. Because there are so much self-reward, of course, in running to something that the dog loves to do, uh, and you have to you have to stop them from doing that. Uh, otherwise, you will anti-train your own training. Um, so, uh, I have a friend that she had a leash or a line, a long line, a ten or twelve meter long line uh, on her dog in one year, and I mean that was a boring year because she had to train every walk if she wanted to have the dog off leash. Uh, so, but it it was really good because after that she had a perfect dog that uh, could. This dog was really really interesting in hunting animals. Uh, in the wild and of course they are not allowed to do that so uh, after one year of really good 
uh, rewards and good recalls and stopping the dog to reward itself. She had a really great recall. And the last thing is uh, practice with distractions. And this is a main thing when it comes to Elsa and me, my training. We start with the distraction training when our puppies are really young. Do you want to add something about that, Elsa? Yes, I think that one is really, really important so that we don't go out into uh, the forest or out on a walk and just train in real life situations to start with. Uh, so that we actually set up situations where we can control the distractions uh, and spend a lot of time doing that with many different distractions. So when a real distraction that we can't control show up, uh, we'd ideally want the dog to believe that, oh, uh, she just added a new distraction. It might be the same thing that, it's, that it usually is. Uh, I better just respond to that recall and come back to her. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so now we had a, another question about um, dropping the retrieve coming up. It's Glenna who, uh, who asked about her dog who tends to drop the retrieve about five or ten feet from me on the return instead of coming in, right into the hand. Very common. We see it all the time. Uh, and our, well, uh, this is a, this could be complex or very easy, <laughs> but we, we uh, the first thing that we teach our dogs is a, a very good hand target. So um, we want the dog to put uh, his nose in our uh, palm. Uh, and we do that uh, like a play, so like a game. So. So the dog loves to run towards to us and uh, uh, pull his um, nose into our palm. Uh, and when they are like crazy about uh, pull it, um, uh, putting the nose in our palm, then we add an object. Uh, so um, uh, that is our first thing uh, we, we start to train when it comes to uh, that problem. But of course we have other things that we do as well. Yes, uh, I think we just have to mention one of our favorite training aids, uh, the reverse luring. We've just mentioned it once already, so let's mention it again. Um, because it's, as Lena said, it's very common that the, the dog will drop the object when there's treats nearby. So with the help of reverse luring, we teach the dog to hold something in its mouth, even though there's treats nearby, because by doing so, uh, the dog will get access to those treats. So um, just a quick of the reverse luring, um, open hand, uh, showing the treat in my open hand means that you're doing the right thing. Uh, if the dog drops the object, I close my hand, uh, and pick up the object and make another try. Um, then show my hand again, open it uh, when the dog holds the object and make sure that I have the time to say, uh, well, thank you or dead or whatever cue I use uh, for, for the re release and reward the dog when it responds to that cue. Yeah, so reverse learning is one of our, as Elsa said, uh, one of our main thing and a very important training thing that we teach the dog when they are very young too, uh, because it's, it's like a, uh, our training or build around this uh, think uh, that reverse learning is. It, it means if you do as I want you to do, then you will get what you want. Uh, and if you control yourself, uh, then you will get what you want, the reward. Or yeah, the reward. And the reward can be like uh, treats or, or play or anything, running to your friend, take a bath, whatever, sniff. Uh, uh, but it's, it's a... Re reverse learning is very helpful in other situations too. So if you want to, to teach a dog reverse learning, please uh, go to our YouTube uh, channel and, um, and our blog on retrievingforlocations.com and uh, you can find films and blogs about reverse learning because we love reverse learning. So we have wrote a lot about it. Great. So we got another question from uh, Monica, uh, which is um, training a flat coated retriever. Is it different? <laughs> different from what? <laughs> <laughs> from training the Labradors or the Tallers. <laughs> or the Cockers. <laughs> the Cockers. The Cockers, they are very complicated to train. I think. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, <laughs> it depends on how you you <laughs> who you ask. I think no, it's not different. I mean, of course, it's different. Uh, uh, they are different individuals, and you can see uh, maybe you can see different things. Uh, we used to say that the caucus are uh, like crea creative and a little bit, uh, they have a lot of fantasy when you work with them and you can compare them with a flat coat retriever maybe. A little bit unmature, uh, they take uh, many years to be grown ups and so on. Uh, but of course we meet, we meet flat coat retrievers that are very serious from the beginning and so on. Um, and we also meet very many, many Labradors that are very serious as they are like 10 weeks and, and like, okay, I'm with you. And they have their costume and so on, uh, already on and ready to, to learn. Uh, but uh, um, I think the most important thing is to see what dog do you have in front of you? Not what breed do you have in front of you, maybe a little bit, but... <laughs> yeah, I think it's about what what, what you prefer, prefer what type of dog. But no, we, we use the same uh, training uh, methods and training philosophy, uh, no matter what breed we're training. But then, of course, we adapt all training to the, in the individual that we have in front of us. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, another question from, from Lisa. How do you introduce different whistle signals at the same time or one signal at a time? Uh, is it confusing for a young dog to learn stop, recall, and search at the same time? That is a very good question. I think the most uh, confusing, confusing thing is when you have signals that are very similar. So the only thing you, you should think about is that don't have a, a, a for example, a, a, a NASDAQ. A hunt whistle. A, a, a hunt whistle. Uh, 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 that reminds of the recall, because then the dog, dog will come into you in front of doing the uh, hunt whistle, so holding an area. So I used to say, if you have a stop that is uh, one signal, which is quite long, like beep, then maybe you should start your holding an area, the, the hunt whistle with a longer signal. So uh, it doesn't remind uh, the dog of the recall which often is shorter more like two three four or five short signals so i think that is the most important thing to think about or what do you say elsa yes i agree definitely uh, rem remembering to having distinct signals so the dog could and um, different differentiate between them uh, but otherwise no we well, we tend to start teaching the, the cues almost at the same time, but we usually do it in different situations. Um, usually the breeder will have started with the recall already uh, when giving the pups food. So hopefully we will get the pup that is uh, already accustomed to the recall whistle. So then we just continue to do that when we're feeding the dog and we, we use it on our walks and reinforce the dog a lot for responding to it. Uh, and then when we start teaching the stop whistle, we usually do that in a slightly different uh, situation. We're probably standing still. We might start in, uh, in the garden um, before bringing it out on the walks. So as not to confuse the dog, we, we do it in, in different situations to start with uh, before starting to mix them together. But we don't wait uh, very long with starting to teach the dog uh, the different uh, the whistle cues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Oh, we have we have a cocker question uh, <laughs> from, from uh, Katrine. Uh, we have a test in Denmark where my cocker has to sit 50 meters from me for one minute. Then you have to recall the dog. And when it, it is 20 meters from you, you have to stop the dog within five meters. My dog continues until he's closer to me, about eight meters. Any good advice how to teach my dog this exercise without ruining his recall? Mm. Uh, well, I think that is, we already have uh, talked about this uh, when we talked about uh, the stop signal uh, in one way, because, uh, well, I think this is a very good example of using uh, where you can use the platform. Mm. So um, um, put the cocker, 50 meters away, the platform 20 meters away, and recall the dog and uh, 
and uh, try to to blow the whistle when it's uh, on the platform. But of course, don't start there. You start much closer. So, so he knows the concept about you are a bit away from the platform and he uh, is supposed to stop at the platform. Uh, and then you, you just uh, add distance and don't, add, don't increase the distance, the boat, the distance to the dog, um, dog platform or platform you at the same time. Uh, I would say that it could be a good idea to to try. And yes, I'd, yeah, right. I'd try the same. Um, reward placement could be one thing as well. Mm -hmm. Having a food bowl behind uh, the dog so that when the dog has stopped, you give it a go ahead cue or a back cue. So it turns around and takes the reward from behind itself. Mm -hmm. And um, if possible, when you know that you are going to stop the dog, uh, you could use a different recall cue, a cue that means you're going to, to stop soon. Um, for example, recall the dog with your voice instead of with the whistle. If uh, the test doesn't demand that you only use your whistle, then you have to do it anyway. Um, but then you also need to reward you know, straight recalls without stopping the dog a lot as well. So the dog doesn't start to get hesitant and anticipating the stop before you actually blow the stop whistle. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have another question from Lisa. Um, in what order do you uh, teach your young dog the different things? If you want to train lines, do you want to have a good stop and search before you do that? My dog sometimes run over the dummy and very far away, so I have to recall him. Uh, if you want to train lines, do you want to have a good stop and search before you do that? No, actually, no, uh, I don't. Uh, uh, I think we start to train uh, all things at the same time. <laughs> as much as possible at the same time. <laughs> yes, yes, as much as possible. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that the most important thing is to teach the dog one thing separately so they are really sure and, and self-confident when you do whatever you do, actually. Uh, I'd say that we usually start with, for example, the casting, um, sending the dog to food bowls. Uh, so then we don't need uh, either, neither the stop nor the, the hunt whistle to start with that. So we could, could do that already with the puppy just before feeding time and using the food bowl when we're anyway going to feed the dog. Um, so that, that way we don't even have to have uh, the delivery to hand um, or the dog knowing how to, well, bring back the dummy in, in a good way before starting teaching the straight lines. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think maybe, Lisa, I don't know you, but uh, I don't think I know you. Uh, 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 maybe you do it a little bit hard for a dog now. So uh, try to, to think before you start your training, try to think, okay, what is the main thing I want to train here? And how can I set up the situation so the dog will... Uh, succeed uh, so then then uh, you will not uh, get the situation where where you you can't solve the problems that uh, that uh, occur yep and also if if the dog runs over the dummy um, it might be that it hasn't got the, the scent of the dummy so it actually hasn't realized that it has to stop and hunt and if that is uh, the problem then I would probably work more on the stop whistle to, to stop the dog when it's in the right area. Um, if the problem is that the dog just loves his straight lines and continues uh, to, to run uh, and you want him to find it easily, I'd use quite visible dummies, uh, white dummies or a, a dummy with a sock over. Uh, so the dog will actually find the dummy very quickly when it reaches the area. So I don't have to do all the things at once. And if I want to practice, um, the hunt whistle, then I might start with uh, making the dog sit in the area, blow the hunt whistle, uh, and then I have hidden the object very, very well. Um, so the dog gets to practice just the hunt whistle before I put all the parts together. Mm. Okay, I think we have um, some more questions on the stop whistle that we have um, prepared. So I'm going to 
show you something that we've written about that. It was about how can I stop my dog when he's busy hunting? And I think we'll say almost the same thing that we said with uh, the recall before, practice with distractions, lots of distractions that you can control. Um, we could use treats, we could use uh, scent from game or dummies um, that we put on the ground. Then we start at a close distance. Uh, we show the dog that there's something very interesting on the ground. Uh, and then we let the dog sniff that interesting area and sniff and sniff and sniff and sniff until the dog is done. And for the first couple of repetitions, that means that the dog uh, lif almost lifts its head and looks at us. Then we blow the stop whistle. And the next time uh, we blow the stop whistle slightly earlier, just when we see that the dog is about to be finished and about to, to lift uh, his head from the area, then we blow the stop whistle and reward the dog a lot. Uh, and then gradually we try to blow the stop whistle earlier and earlier when the dog is more and more busy. Uh, and uh, since we have this area that we know that the dog will run to and stay in, we could also increase the distance between the dog and us. So as the dog gets more and more uh, confident, uh, we walk further away from the area. So we're further away when we blow the stop whistle. And I think that is one of our favorite exercises actually to teach the dog to, to respond to the stop whistle when, uh, when it's very busy hunting. Mm. And you can, all, uh, you can almost do the same um, thing when you uh, train the recall actually. Just uh, um, uh, when you want to train distractions and recall training, just um, um, put some treats on the or some scent on the on the ground, and recall the dog when you think they are ready and they can hear you and so on, uh, and then you just make it harder and harder. So this mm -hmm. is a, yeah, it's a good uh, exercise to to use in both. Ways. Yeah, and for recall as well, because uh, when you've practiced, been practicing recall for a while, uh, you will end up with a dog just walking very, very close to you. <laughs> so you can't do another recall. But this way, uh, you could actually leave the dog because it's busy for looking for things. Uh, and then you could increase the distance between you and the dog and get to actually practice a recall when the dog is busy. Because just making the dog sit, walk away and then recall it. That, that's not uh, what the recall will look like in, in real life. No, true. Um, we got a question from Liz uh, Hiles. Uh, she says, I find myself with a dog who has no enthusiasm for learning proper gun dog training. I'm interested though. So do you have any ideas which exercises I can adapt to short sessions in the living room? She's a Sussex Spaniel with short legs. Ah. Oh. So I, I, I got curious, uh, is she interested in, in your rewards? Uh, can she play tag? Can she play? Um, develop your rewards and, and uh, teach her to play, I think. Uh, uh, will be my first answer. Uh, and then you can, if you have really, if you had good rewards, then you can train whatever you want, I think. So what does your Spaniel like to do? Um, and of course, when you have a dog that is not so mo motivated, uh, try to do really, really short sessions. It can be like 30 seconds or even uh, uh, not that long. Uh, if he's, he or she is interested in treats, um, try to, but not in play, try to play with the treats. Uh, you can put a little, a little, uh, a short string. Yeah, thank you. A <laughs> short string around the treat and pull it on the floor. And if the dog like sniffs after it or use his paws, then bingo, then you have uh, the beginning of a, uh, of a play. And then you can de develop that to play with other things after that. So be patient, develop your, your uh, rewards, I would say. Yep. And some uh, short, nice exercises that you could do uh, in your living room is, for example, the hand target, as we talked about before, um, reverse luring. And you could also, to increase uh, 
the, do the dog's interest in training, you could teach it a lot of tricks. Um, it, it's not gun dog training, but it will make the dog realize how valuable you are. So then, then later on, when you suggest something and that you want to train, and the dog knows, oh, training with her is usually very fun and very interesting. So it will make the dog ready to learn other things as well. So tricks training is uh, really great to do. Yeah. The more you teach a dog things, the more teachable it will be. <laughs> so uh, tricks is uh, really great. I have to be much better with that. My first dog is a really good. He, he's a re he has so many tricks, but my, my uh, fifth, fifth dog, he's not that good. I'm lazy. Yeah, I have the same thing. My, my, my first first dog, or second dog, actually, she knew so many different tricks, I think 15, 20 different ones. And then uh, Keen, um, what does he know? I, I'm, I haven't even taught him to, to remove the socks, which I've taught no. all the other dogs. So I, I should have that as my homework, actually te teaching some, some tricks yeah. to him as well. Me too, me too. Um, okay, so I think we're doing one last uh, question, and it's uh, Paula who asks, how do I get my lab more interested in retrieving? He gets distracted as he runs out and then ignores the dummy when he gets to it. Have used a snack dummy, which has helped, but I need to build desire for a dummy or a toy, etc. Yeah, well, that's a good uh, question, and, and it's. Uh, uh, I think you are on the right track when you think uh, that you want to build desire but i think it's more important that you build desire to the reward actually so uh, try to find really really good rewards and then he will pick up everything that sounds very simple i know that is not so simple but but uh, uh, really actually it's it's i think sometimes we we uh, don't understand how important that thing is about the good rewards so but of course uh, uh, you can also get um, uh, teach him to to pick up things that he's more interested in i use those small uh, tennis balls with uh, rabbit skin around them uh, and um, a dog that tend to be a, a little bit like your lab as you describe the lab loves them so much that they don't, don't want to uh, deliver them. So that is a good thing to, to try things. What does he like to, to carry when he is at home? Does he any, have any favorite shoe or something? Yeah, if you could get the dog interested in carrying one object, you could try to transfer that to other objects. And I would also recommend practicing the things that you don't need to use uh, objects to practice. Practice that without objects. For example, casting. If the dog is food motivated, use food balls instead. Uh, and then when the dog is more interested in, in, in dummies, then you could switch to retrieving a well, putting a dummy instead of the food bowl. Uh, so you don't have to have a dummy at the end. You could send the dog for the food bowl or for its uh, favorite a fluffy toy or uh, something else yeah. and it, it might also be that the dog could retrieve one or two dummies and then it's not that interested anymore so use dummies for the first two repetitions and then you use food balls and the next time perhaps you could use dummies for three repetitions and then you use food balls so you 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 mix it um so that the dog keeps up its interest so let's take just one more question. I know we can <laughs> yeah. answer it very short, briefly. When you, Catherine writes, when you introduce left and right casting, do you practice both directions at the same time or start with, for instance, left for several weeks? Yes, we practice both. <laughs> both. Yeah, that, that was a quick question. Yes, yeah. definitely. I use, yeah. um, we perhaps do five to the left and five to the right, and then we take a break, and then we yeah. do five to the, to the right or and two to the left so definitely start both of them at the same time yeah that was a quick question yes, of course. <laughs> yes so the final things that we just want to share with you and we unfortunately we don't have time to answer any more questions at the moment so we definitely have to come back and do more of these sessions it's so great to to see uh which questions you want us uh, to answer and um, we just wanted to 
show you some news. We have a new study guide uh, based on uh, the book, Retrieving for Locations, which is uh, intermediate. So it's a bit more um, difficult setups in this study guide uh, than in uh, the previous one, which was the foundations. It is based on the book though. So you need both the book and the study guide to, to use the study guide to its full extent. And then uh, we also released several new online courses. Uh, we have um, stop whistle, heel work, holding an area, uh, and casting. And there are a few early birds uh, bots left, so then you will get 30% discount on uh, those spots if you're quick to, to sign up. So go on to our web page, uh, retrievingforlocations.com, and you'll find them. Yeah, and uh, also we have a 20% discount on all online courses that aren't already discounted. So use the coupon code RFAOQA2101 <laughs> and buy before January 31st. So thank you all for joining us tonight. We really enjoyed your questions. And um, we want to wish you a very good luck with your training and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.